Hi, friends. Welcome back to Not Again, the podcast that brings college-level analysis to preschool-level content. I'm one of your hosts, Rebecca. And I'm your other host, Alan. And today, and probably next week, and probably the week after that, we are talking about the live-action Beauty and the Beast. Indeed we are. Because of course we are. I can't believe it took us this long to get to it, honestly. I think we just didn't want to watch it again. Yeah, that's probably it. This is one that Warren hasn't watched in a while, but when... It was on Netflix, I think. Yeah, this, Wasn't it it, this was before Disney Plus got can, the right, rights to it. You got the rights back from yeah. Netflix. So, so um, when it was on Netflix, Warren watched it pretty much nonstop, which is really, it was really surprising because he doesn't do a lot of live action stuff. Yeah, he does do more like uh, things with singing sometimes, or at least he did back then. He liked it when they were singing. So I think that was probably it. Yeah, and then there's like, pretty colors i guess something about it drew his gaze and he watched it again and again and this was problematic because i loathe the live action beauty and the beast we saw it in theaters and beauty and the beast is my favorite cartoon disney princess movie so like genre wise there's Disney cartoon, you know, I love Lilo and Stitch and The Emperor's New Groove, but then princess movie is kind of its own genre. And while I love Mulan, I never considered that to be a princess movie because she's not princess. I think they claim it's, she's a Disney princess. They have to for the diversity. Oh, I see. So when she, when they do the lunchbox with the Disney princesses, they have Mulan on there and they have Tiana. They, Tiana becomes a princess. Tiana, yeah, Tiana's on There's there. There's one other who isn't actually a princess, though, who ends up on there, I think. But anyway, yeah, so I love Mulan, the cartoon. But I was not, I didn't have high hopes for the remakes. Beauty and the Beast is one of the first. I think they did Cinderella before that, and I couldn't have cared less, right? Yeah. Maybe there's like a wiki. I think it was the, the Maleficent or whatever. That was, does that count? Or is that like a, uh, the, I they, think, yeah. is that like a wicked ripoff? It's sort of both. I think it was, I think it was their attempt at making Sleeping Beauty palatable in any way. Oh, I, yeah, Beauty's, I suppose. It's Sleeping Beauty. It's, it's Sleeping, a little problematic these days. Yeah, apparently Sleeping Beauty, the cartoon, tanked, which I didn't know. We watched it nonstop when we were little. Oh, is that one of those things where it was only popular after... A lot of Disney movies were yeah. like that, yes. Okay. Before we get to it, though, I, there's a couple things that I should have said at the end of the last episode, and you might have even heard me stalling and mentioning random stuff until I tried to remember it, but I wanted to wait until Alan was back to say an official welcome to our new patron. So thank you and welcome. We have a p- new patron. Thank you. We appreciate your patronage. And the other thing I wanted to say is this is a tricky needle to thread <laughs> because I got some really good news, but the good news is rated R. So <laughs> those of you who follow me on Twitter will already know, but I submitted a short story for consideration in a compilation with Violet Gaze Press. Violet Gaze Press is a small independent publisher that does romance novels of the sexy kind, and they focus on including characters that aren't oft seen in mainstream literature. So whether that might be plus size characters or people of color or people with autism, even like they, they look for just representation. And I wrote a story about two Jewish characters because honestly, you don't see a lot of Jewish characters in literature, unless it's like the all of a kind family, which we talked about last time, which is specifically, you know, but I decided that can be my M.O. since Alicia, the main character of Hellbound, is also a Jewish. Why not? I'll just make myself yes. the, the Jewish character writer. Anyway, so while I'm very happy about that and wanted to announce it and be proud of it because they did, in fact, accept that short story. I don't think I said that yet. They accepted yeah, yeah. it. Yay. Congratulations. Um, yay. Woohoo. It does contain rated R material, so it's not exactly, um, it's the, like the opposite of this podcast in every way. So don't read it if you don't like me being associated with rated R content. <laughs> if you want to keep seeing me as a loving mother, um, who, who, who really doesn't think about things that are raunchy, then, then don't read it. It's okay. If, if you want to support me, buy the book and then immediately burn it. That's fine too. But yay, that's what I wanted to say. So Beauty and the Beast live action. We saw it in theaters because I wanted to, even though I thought this is going to come up a lot. We're going to probably dedicate an entire episode to how Emma Watson was m- miscast or rather not miscast. She, she should not have been cast as Belle. 
A lot of people go crazy over her, but that's kind of the point is that she was popular and I suppose still is. And I think she was a popularity cast and not like a, you fit this role really well cast. And we will get to that. So, and I'm not, honestly, I'm not on the Emma Watson train very much. Like I think she's done a lot of work for women and charities and stuff. And that's great. I don't hate her. It's just... I don't think she is a spectacular actress and she kind of rubs me the wrong way. So does Emma Thompson. So maybe I just don't like the name Emma, but I had my doubts and at first I kind of liked it. I remember leaning over to you in the theater and saying, actually, I kind of like it. I think mm-hmm. we thought it was gonna be really bad. I think we, we were, we came in with low expectations and then they kind of got a little better and then they kind of got yeah. satisfied. Oh, we went in with low well, expectations. That- so was this one of our date nights? Like where we were just like, it's a movie and we're getting away from the kid. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, back on uh, Emma Watson, like my the way I kind of describe it is like I would like to be at a dinner party with Emma Watson and like we could talk and she could talk about the charity work she does and all this sort of stuff. I think she's probably a pretty chill person. Very intelligent. Very as well. intelligent as well. And but it's just like I do, I'm not a fan of her in that in that vein that some people are like I don't really understand some people obsess over yeah I don't really understand that at all like I would just be like hey you know like what's going on in your life not like drooling yeah. I don't know why people are like that the problem there's a couple problems with these live action Disney movies Aladdin ran into this a lot as well which is that even though this seems obvious to point out human beings the real physical flesh and blood human beings can't move like cartoons do and so you get these scenes that are supposed to be full of life with people flitting from here to there and big expressions that like human beings wouldn't actually be able to put on their faces and everything big and bold and everything like that. And then you try to get human beings to imitate it. And a really good example of this is Josh Gad doing the Gaston song. Uh, uh, yeah, as, as LeFou, who is a, who is like a, a really cartoonish character very in the cartoonish. cartoon. Like very, yeah. If you compare those two songs, in the cartoon, LeFou is twirling. He's over here, he's over there. He's jumping on other men's heads as stepping stones, which you can't do. He's swinging from the chandelier, right? And they try to have Josh Gad do that, and he works with it as much as he can. I actually have no problems with Josh Gad. I think that I have come to respect him more as an actor since Disney got their shackles on him. But there's a, a teeny tiny little spot where he tries to jump up onto the table, kind of imitating that cartoonish action. And you just see how stilted and you, I know this is stupid, but you see that he's affected by gravity in that moment. You're like, this is a human being trying to jump onto a table and it's very awkward. Yeah, well, it was a cartoon. It's fanciful. It's 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 wild. It's you know like uh, the animaniacs bouncing off the walls, yes. right? But it it's like he's just a guy trying to jump up on the table and takes your immersion away, uh, like a little. Yeah, and so that, and then again, the live action Aladdin, which I thought was actually one of their. I mean, this is a low bar to clear, but it was one of their more successful remakes in my mind, despite Aladdin being quite wooden and Will Smith occasionally attempting to be genie from the cartoon. The the scene where they they do the one jump ahead of the hitman. I why don't I know I know all these song titles and then I start I hit record on this podcast and don't know the song titles. But they had to speed up and slow down the footage in order to make it seem more quickly moving than it is. And again, if you look at that scene in the cartoon, Aladdin slips behind one guard and pulls down his pants and then suddenly he's somewhere else and it's because he's a cartoon and he can do that. So I think it would have been better for these remakes if they had decided to, well, do a remake. You see a lot of the same lines being used and you see them attempting to be the cartoon when I think they should have accepted that they are live action and really tried to reimagine the story, but they wanted to capitalize on the nostalgia of the cartoons to get people in to buy tickets. And so they couldn't diverge too far from that path. So I leaned over to Alan in the theater and I, it was the opening scene with the poor provincial town that wasn't very poor. And we'll get to that. And I said, Oh, I kind of like it. And then Emma Watson started singing and I was suddenly listening to auto tune the news, which was a meme from a long time ago. And then I didn't like it anymore. Well, I, before we get on to that, I, I want to I want to talk more about these quick cuts. Do you do you know the do you know like the the not probably the, the most famous, but like the most famous quick cut thing among like movie buff people? 
I don't even know what you're... Oh, uh, so in the movie Taken 3... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Liam Neeson, who is an old man, is playing a uh, action buff hero. And at one point, he has to run up and jump over this chain link fence. And I think somebody counted it. You can find this on YouTube. There are 13 cuts of just little movements of this guy going over the fence. It's just a dude jumping over it's a just fence, a dude, but they cut it and cut it and cut it to make it look To make more, it look like it was fast. Like he can still do Instead of action. an old man jumping, <laughs> like, barely wheezing his way over this fence. Exactly. So that's, and that's how we saw it. We saw it in the theaters, and I basically decided I never want to see this again. And Fate heard me decide that. And Fate then put the, sh- the movie on, on Netflix, and somehow Warren found it, and... I ended up seeing it again and again and again to the point where I was saying, not again. Hmm. I wonder why that's relevant. I don't know. Sounds familiar, but I don't know. And so what I did is very much like with Brave and other things that I never wanted to see again. I took one for the team and I rewatched the live action Beauty and the Beast. And these are my notes. I'm not letting you read them so much as see how long they are, which is why we are doing three episodes on this. I I um I got 10 minutes into the movie and looked down at how many no- notes I had and went I should take fewer notes. <laughs> like I saw the timestamp and I was like that's all that's past is like this teeny little bit of the movie and it's long. It's a long movie. Yeah, that's a criticism I really want to bring up cuz Disney cartoons are importantly 90 minutes. Yep, sometimes even 88 Some, with yeah, credits. Yeah. And so when you live action the same story and the story doesn't get more story, it just gets longer. Well, look at what happens when they live action those Dr. Seuss books and try to pad the story. Well, it never, yeah, it never goes well. Yeah, it ne- never goes well. Oh, I, um, speaking of our levels, we weren't speaking of our levels, but I was looking at our levels. We are recording in the office today, our original recording space, because Ari is napping in the room where the walk-in closet is that is our current recording space. So if it's a little echoey today, I'm sorry. I did also discover some new tools on GarageBand I'm going to fiddle with to try to take it away, but I'm not good at technology. So sorry about any potential echo, but that's why we sound a little different. But yes, so we're kind of into the podcast now, so we should probably, you know, get into the podcast. We should probably actually talk about this movie. Yeah, we've been kind of jumping all over the place. Now, the thing is that the purpose of the Disney live action remakes, well, other than A, making money and B, maintaining their copyrights that are expiring. that's a huge part of it. um, Hence why they remade Dumbo, even though no one wanted that, uh, is also to quote fix plot holes that people point out again and again and again with the cartoons. And there are many with Beauty and the Beast cartoon, but the thing is that it's a cartoon for kids and I forgave most of those plot holes. For instance, when Belle gets the beast on the horse. How? How? But nobody cares. They cut away and the beast is on the horse. It's the same thing with Finding Nemo where they cut away from one scene and they're like falling to their doom or whatever. And then the next scene, Marlin and Dory are asleep in the mask and it's on the submarine somehow like it doesn't matter okay it's a cartoon yeah but they decided to take it upon themselves to fix these plot holes and with beauty and the beast it is a train wreck because in attempting to quote fix these plot holes a lot of them a lot of these fixes open up new plot holes and so we're gonna have to discuss those and alan and i were talking about like do i i took a list and this is the list of the plot holes right here you can see with my finger and thumb yes there's a lot of them do we spend an entire episode just talking about the plot holes or do we kind of weave them in but i think we're gonna try to weave them in oh i I thought we were gonna go the other way i thought this could be the plot hole episode but then we would have to kind of recap the plot anyway to make it make sense yeah so that's why i was thinking i actually just changed my mind is the thing i didn't inform that i changed my mind i I, sometimes i like to keep him guessing you know keep the marriage alive by a little add a little zest yeah zagging when he thinks i'm gonna zig so I think we're going to have to just try to work them in, and then I will keep referencing my plot hole list to make sure we didn't skip one. I'm going to try to talk about them when they come up in the actual movie. So we'll see how it goes, okay? The opening of Beauty and the Beast cartoon. Iconic. Stained glass tells a story. Our first plot hole appears as the prince is, if you do the math, 11 years old, and therefore A, should not be opening the door to his own castle, and B, should not actually be accepting strangers to come and live with him. So that's the plot hole number one, is that he was a little boy, and also a servant would have opened the door, and also if an 11-year-old said, no, strange woman, you can't stay in my castle, it probably wouldn't have been a show of vanity, it probably would have been something that any parent would have said to their child to do, is like, turn them away. 
they do try. Is this one that they try to fix? Yep. Okay. So we'll get to that. But it's a it's still a beautiful way of opening with the stained glass and with David Ogden Styers narration. David Ogden Styers plays Codsworth in the cartoon, but he also narrates the opening. Uh, the once upon a time. There was a prince who lived in a castle, and it's beautiful and, and iconic. And they gave that opening narration to Emma Thompson. And while some people like her, I don't know when it happened that I decided I don't like her. She just rubs me the wrong way. I think Nanny McPhee did it because I saw Nanny McPhee, and it's the worst movie I've ever seen. No, I've never seen it, so maybe I'm better off. Yeah, you are better off, trust me. And they gave, and she's famous, and so they gave her this huge part, and. She overacts all the way through it. I don't like it, and I don't like her doing the opening narration. <laughs> but that being said, I do like the opening sequence. I think that what's his face? I want you to. I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit and be like, let, just let you guys know. I made sure I got David Ogden Styers' name right, even though I was like 99 percent sure I was right. I'm not going to look up the Prince dude's name. I know he's somewhat famous, the actor who plays the Prince, but. His name is probably James. Yeah, we're just gonna that guy, the guy who's in the movie. I'll, I'll I'll Google it at some point, but that guy does a very good job. So for those who haven't seen it, they open with the prince putting on just an overabundance of makeup. He powders his face. He puts blue paint on his eyes. He rouges his cheeks, and it is a wonderful symbolism. You know, symbolism. It's a wonderful symbolism. It symbolizes his vanity very well, right? Because he takes a lot of time, and it even introduces the servants because Lumiere is in the background holding the candlestick for him to see by, and you know, one of the servants is holding the mirror for him. I think maybe plumets or something. You know, and that kind of thing. So it, it kind of teases the existence of these servants, and it. And it also pro pro provides us his vanity. And my favorite bit is actually when it switches to the throne room, we have Audra McDonald, who I know from Ragtime, beautiful singer, um, singing just a background, basically, with Stanley Tucci, with, you know, her husband. And hey, I mean, they included a lot of people of color in this movie. Yay. <laughs> Gold star for trying, Disney. So Audra McDonald's fantastic. She's singing. There's this kind of chaotic scene with all these young women who are clearly trying to become the prince's wife, basically, fiance. Yeah. And he is lounging in the throne, which I love. He's not sitting up straight and proper. He is lounging in it. He's comfortable in it. And when he gets up, it's such a fluid motion to join the dance. Like, I really love that. I should, I suppose, give him credit for, you know... So, so the opening sequence, I don't know if you remember it, like if you have anything to say about it, but I liked it. It, it, it set, it sets up, it sets up his, uh, his, his problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, first of all, it establishes him as an adult. So yes, basically they fixed this plot hole fine enough. This is one of the ones that, you know, okay. Dan Stevens. His name is Dan Stevens. It's not James at all. I'm sorry, Dan Stevens. I feel like I should give you credit for being good at this. Maybe not later, but Good enough. So Dan Stevens does a great job and it establishes he's an adult at the time. So what they did to change this, and this is a fine little fix, is obviously he's an adult when you see him. This this is two plot holes, actually, because later also um, in the very beginning of the cartoon, there is a painting of the prince grown up. That he couldn't, that couldn't possibly exist. Like that's when the beast rips that painting and oh, Belle looks right. at it later. Yeah, because we don't know what he would have grown up to look like. Right at the time he was a kid, so the fact that there's a grown up painting of him. So the two plot holes there, right? Fix one, he's older, and then the only other time it's mentioned is in Be Our Guest, uh, when Lumiere in the cartoon sings, "For ten years we've been rusting, needing so much more." Uh, and the reason that we know that it's that he was eleven at the time is because uh, the ro the curse of the rose, the narrator tells us, it blooms until his twenty first birthday. Yeah. So what he did is what he did. Yeah, you and McGregor change the lyric no what they did is they changed it to for so long we've been rusting so it's just an ambiguous amount of time and they fixed that yay most of the plot hole fixes do not go this way but uh the opening sequence is ruined by the entrance of the enchantress believe it or not because of the narration the narrator emma thompson calls the enchantress an unexpected intruder so right there we are supposed to believe that the enchantress is there to teach him a lesson, but calling her an intruder has the connotation of she's in the wrong for being there. And we're not supposed to believe that. We are supposed to believe the princess in the wrong for, for being vain, for turning her away, for judging by appearances. Hey, I found a lesson. 
don't judge people by their outward appearances. Yeah. That one's going to get hammered home. Uh, Except that in the end, all of the ugly people turn beautiful again. Yes. Well, I always thought that, so the lesson that the beast needs to learn is not to judge by appearances. So in order to solidify that he had learned that lesson, he should have met Belle and found her to be homely and then fallen in love with her anyway because her personality is cool. Instead, the person who learns a lesson not to judge by appearances is Belle, who falls in love with a literal beast, but she never had that problem. Like, she didn't even like Gaston. She, his appearance was beautiful. If she had that problem, she would have been like, Gaston, you're beautiful. Marry me. But she was like, I don't care that you're pretty. Like, she's the one who does not need to learn that lesson. She doesn't need to learn this lesson at all. No, so actually the very <laughs> title of the film messes up the lesson from the beginning. Beauty and the Beast. He's like, the enchantress is like, you're too vain. You need to learn that outside appearances aren't what really matters. I'm going to send this beautiful girl to your castle so you can fall in love with her. But but she's pretty, yeah? But she's also good on the inside, so... Yeah. No, but she's pretty, so she's pretty on the outside, so I'm not learning anything. And shut up, here's a rose, you know, that kind of thing. So it doesn't work. It's a terrible lesson, but the lesson exists. That's what they want you to learn. Don't judge a book by its cover, even though you are absolutely supposed to judge books by their covers, as I have said. Otherwise, books wouldn't have pretty covers. Um, But you aren't supposed to judge people by their appearances. And uh, beauty is only skin deep and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But she bursts into the castle. So in the cartoon, she's at the door knocking. Mm -hmm. In the live action movie, I'm going to keep saying movie as if the cartoon wasn't a movie. In the live action movie, she kind of, like she taps on the glass window door thing, but then kind of bursts in with the wind, right? So she intrudes. Uh, You know, Mm -hmm. of course. So basically what I'm saying is, Not only does the narrator call her an intruder, but anybody would turn someone away who literally busted into their house and was like, let me stay here. So, yeah, in in the cartoon, it's a a homely person comes to the door and says, and not just homely, but perhaps uh, Uh, an old beggar woman, a beggar woman, like somebody who is so poor, uh, someone needs help, comes to the door and says, I need help. I will. Gi- all I have to give is this rose. Right. I have nothing to offer you. But I have, please, I need shelter. But please, I have, I have nothing to offer you but this rose. And the and the the wealthy prince turns her away. Right. And the and so there's the also in that less. I learned a lesson. The lesson there is that you know wealth is for 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 helping. Right, yes, like you're supposed to use if here, you have. If you have, you're supposed to help the have. Yeah, lots. he's he's spending all this money on this fabulous parties and his makeup and his music and his dancing and all this sort of stuff. That money is also for helping. That's not part of this in this movie. She doesn't need anything. Yeah, she just shows up and says like, "You're vain." <laughs> You're I'm so, going to teach you a lesson about it. You're so vain. You probably think this rose is about you. Yeah. Um, and on top of that, in the cartoon version, the prince was clearly in the wrong. The beggar woman was clearly in the right. You know what I mean? Was the enchantress in the right for cursing him for all time for this one moment? No. But at the very least, there was a, apparently an old woman in need of help and a vain rich person turning her away despite not needing to. He could have given her a room. In the live action, she doesn't appear... She bursts in, so she intrudes, and then she doesn't appear to really need help, and she even comes in with, like, a little magic, and so she does seem untrustworthy. She does seem like somebody who would give you pause, and so it's ambiguous who's in the right at that time, and that doesn't really go away. The whole time, Agatha, the Enchantress, is... Not necessarily, they paint her as the antagonist again and again and again, and I don't like that. So that's the intro sequence. So that's where the intro sequence kind of fell apart for me. She's an intruder, especially since the the motif of guests is a big thing. I mean, there's literally a song called Be Our Guest. To call her an intruder instead of an unexpected guest is a missed opportunity. So bad on you, writers. So they made the prince an adult. Plot hole number one, that one works just fine. Adults should be responsible for their own decisions. However, later they do imply that he's only a bad person because his dad was abusive, which kind of 
it's an interesting choice to me because it's almost like saying, oh, he can't be to blame for anything that he does because he didn't know better. He was treated badly himself. And people who have been abused sometimes do become abusers themselves, but other times they don't. And so to say abuse automatically creates bad people, it's kind of mean to the people who have, you know, thrived and survived despite abuse and become good people despite it. But the opening narration gives us some more plot holes. In the cartoon, there's a couple of things that people point out on the internet and on BuzzFeed and stuff. Number one, there was a prince and a royal family in this castle that was apparently quite nearby a town. Why didn't the townspeople wonder what had happened to their leader and ruler? Like, they would have been aware that there was a prince there and would have been confused had he suddenly holed up in his castle and never let anyone visit him ever again. They solved this problem by having the Enchantress erase the memories of everybody in the town that the, like, castle existed and blocking the way to the castle with a tree that Maurice only finds his way past because some lightning strikes it down. Now, this is going to be kind of a, people will say, well, the Enchantress knew what she was doing she, the, all along kind of thing, but, you know, she was waiting for Belle or whatever it is. She's all knowing. But we don't get that impression. So one thing is, yeah, so they erase their memories, fine. So now they don't know they have a prince, except that he's supposed to be learning a lesson. The lesson is that he needs to fall in love with somebody, and she literally blocked off the path to his castle and made everybody forget about him so that no one would ever seek him out. So how exactly did she expect him to meet anybody to fall in love with? Also, if your prince needs to learn a lesson, um, who gave this enchantress the right to just screw with everybody's memory? I mean, presumably some of these people in the town were moral upstanding folk who did not deserve to be dunked on in this way. Some of them probably even made money delivering goods to the castle. <laughs> like, did they just go, huh, I find myself poor and destitute where I wasn't before. I wonder why that happened. And on top of that, they decided to solve the Mrs. Potts doesn't have a Mr. Potts thing. And I don't know if that needed solving. Like, sometimes people die. Did, did we need to know what, why Mrs. Potts didn't have a husband? And so Mr. Potts was in the town and Mrs. Potts wasn't. And so her husband lost his memory of her, which adds on to what you were saying. Why did Mr. Potts deserve to be punished by losing his entire family? And like, it, it is a punishment for people who don't deserve it. And it, it's also kind of a, a, a punishment that does not fit the crime at all. He refuses to let her stay in his castle for one night. So she <laughs> turns everybody into furniture or beasts and cuts off his castle and makes an eternal winter there, which is another plot hole they decided to solve that again, nobody cares about. It, it was kind of fall-ish when Belle entered the castle and then winter, but it only seemed to be a couple days. So that's another plot hole. It's like, how did it become winter so quickly? And so they were like, well, it's eternal winter in the castle. Actually, sometimes it's fall one day and then like two, three days later, it's, it's like winter because yeah. seasons kind of change like that. Yeah. So, uh, but they did that. So my thing is, sure, you erased everybody's memories, but that again puts the enchantress of, in the villain spot of like, I'm going to curse you until you find love, but I'm also going to make it impossible for anybody to find you. Was he supposed to venture out on his own? Was he supposed to use that stupid plot hole book to like find his way to Paris and find a young woman at the Moulin Rouge to take with him and you and McGregor her up or what? Like, what what did she expect him to do well, that's a good, to learn this lesson? That's a good question because if if she wanted him to learn this lesson by taking away his beauty or whatever, all he did was sit behind in his castle and do nothing and he never had to reveal himself to anybody except for one person. Yeah, and nobody like nobody ever saw him. He didn't experience he was re he felt revulsion at his own appearance, but he didn't even experience other people's revulsion. Like the idea was he did not like her appearance when she was in disguise, so the equivalent punishment would be for him to suffer through other people looking at him the way he looked at her. But his servants all love him, and she cut off everybody else, so nobody ever has to look at him. Nobody ever looks at him, except for one, like, except for Belle. Except for one person who has to learn the lesson that appearances don't matter, even though she didn't need to learn that lesson. Because she already didn't put very much value on appearances. Exactly. So there are other plot holes, but 
again, I'm going to try to bring them up as they come up naturally in this, in the events of things and this, in the course of events. So the next thing that we see is the little town song. And this is reason number one, why Emma Watson was cast because she was popular, not because she was good for the part. They auto tune her very, very obviously. And I, for all that Disney is not, you know, perfect. The one thing that they always provided or at least tried to provide was beautiful music and they often succeeded. There are some iconic songs in these movies that people know to this day and grew up with and auto-tune feels like a huge middle finger to have auto-tune in a Disney movie. And then it's just, it's no contest comparing Paige O'Hara's voice to Emma Watson's voice. They had to, um... They had to, again, I have to remind people, I have a good ear, but I can't sing for anything. Um, They had to alter down. I don't know how to say it. Not tone down. There's a pitch down, pitch down, maybe, because in the song where she sings, I'm not going to sing it. I'm just trying to remember the lyric. She's she's, in the cartoon is when she has the sheep and she's showing her or showing the sheep the, the book and is going, this is my favorite part. Oh, oh, isn't this amazing? It's my favorite part because you see uh, here's where she meets Prince Charming. That section of the song is a higher octave or at least a higher uh-huh. register. I'm not sure about sure. the singing terms, but they had to pitch that down for Emma Watson to be able to hit it, even with auto-tune. Oh, yeah. Because she, yeah, I, she, no one can hit I mean, not well, no one, but like no, that's a it, tough it, note to hit. But, but, but you're Disney. You can just hire somebody Dub who can. Dub her. Dub her. Well, this is the thing. This is we, We've talked about this. Disney has never been afraid in the past. You can look at the credits of a lot of these cartoons – they have an actor with an acting voice and a singer with a singing voice for the same character. No, it doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen, Sometimes but they, they do are the it. Singer, but they are perfectly happy to do it for the cartoons when they need to. For instance, Josh Gad didn't need to be dubbed. No problem, right? Josh yeah. Gad is a singer, clearly classically trained, right? If he isn't, I'd eat my shoe. But Emma Watson, they gave her tons and tons of singing lessons and then still had to auto-tune her. Get her a singing voice. I think part of my problem, well, part of my problem with her is throughout this movie, not only does she not comport herself like somebody who believes they are beautiful, right? She's supposed to turn heads, but she always seems kind of bored and self-conscious. We'll get to that. But on top of that, I think maybe she knew she wasn't right for the part. I don't know. I can't speak to her motivations, but it doesn't help that she can't live up to this, the, the, fill the shoes that this original soundtrack left. And so she's supposed to be turning heads and show-stopping numbers and all of that, and she's not. She just isn't. And I don't know. The performance is sleepy at times, it's bored at times, it's self-conscious at times, and I wonder if she didn't feel it. I don't know how vain Emma Watson is, honestly. That's the problem. I don't know if she was aware of this or if she just wasn't into it. But as you often say, if somebody called you up and was like, do you want to be in a Disney movie? You'd just be like... Yeah, Disney's writing me a check. It's going to be a big one. So, I mean, yes. like, yeah. I mean, the answer would be yes. The, the joke, I mean, it's like... They called Emma Watson. She was like, do you want to be in Beauty and the Beast? She's like, yes. Am I like a dish or something? Like, no. You're beauty. Uh... It's money, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, somebody could have called me up and said that, and I would have been like, well, number one, I'm not particularly, like, beautiful in comparison to other women, and number two, I sing like a cat dying. Are you okay with that? And they've been like, yeah, and I've been like, fine, write the check, right? So I'm I'm not above getting money, but I don't like her for the part, and, we'll, and I will actually point out some times when that happened, like, when you can see for yourself what I'm talking about. I'm going to try to be, I'm going to try to provide evidence for it, but auto-tune. The other thing that happens is that she's singing about this poor provincial town she's living in. And as you pointed out, this is a very wealthy town. The town is quite prosperous, very prosperous. They have uh, lots and lots of uh, thriving businesses, very expensive, extravagant looking clothes, especially for the time. Yes. Um, they have a, a donkey a, that washes, donkey. that washes stuff. The donkey washing machine. Oy vey. Uh, but no, the, 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 the market is bustling. Lots of activity, lots of transactions going on. Somebody's overcharging for eggs. That's how prosperous it is. Prosperous it is. Um, there's a schoolhouse. There's a ton of buildings. It just, they made, they wanted to make it sparkle and shine. And in doing so, there's just kind of this irony of her being like, ah, I hate this poor town and me going, I'm not good at history, but 
as far as towns go in that time period, I feel like that one's probably not as poor as it could be. Maybe that's her vanity. She's only yeah. she's only vain a, a, against towns. Belle like, needs to learn not to judge towns by their covers. She's like, this ain't Paris. Come on. She needs to fall in love with the town for is what she, it is and not for the Now that would have been a good rewrite. She needs to fall in love with the town. Yes. So this is where I think we will stop for episode one is, is since we're kind of ragging on Emma Watson, let's talk about the scene that I always point to for the way that she comports herself. And I think, I don't, I I think it could be a direction problem. Like, I don't think she's incapable as an actress. I just, I wonder what went on to create this. So another plot hole that they decided to fill in a town where nobody reads in the cartoon, there is an entire bookshop that is in business, even though Belle is clearly the only one in town that reads. And that is a plot hole, right? How would this man be in business? So, of course, they solved this one. This one is one of the ones that successfully solved, right, as opposed to creating other th- problems. Instead of a bookshop, there is the church chapel thing. Yeah, I'm bad at Christian ter- terminology, but there's a church or something. I know pair means father so whatever so she goes to see Pere Robert at the church or wherever she is and and there's no library he just has a small selection of books that she can borrow I don't I'm not going to pronounce this name right but the actor who plays Pere Robert is named Ray Ferron F-E-A-R-O-N I, Ferron whatever it yeah. may be one and of those he is just sparkling in this scene every line is dripping with charisma his smile is engaging he's trying to banter with her and he's like where did you fly off to this week and i was instantly taken in by this man who honestly this was the biggest part he played in the movie like later he helps her clean up her donkey laundry or whatever but that's it right and he just stole the scene meanwhile Emma Watson has kind of the smirk on her face where she's just kind of like, oh, I went to two towns in Italy. I didn't want to come back. And he's like, oh, well, which book do you want to read next? And she's like, this one. And he's like, wonderful. Please and bon voyage, he says. And she goes, bye. Like she slouches out of the room. Like she's not even standing up particularly straight. You have to go back and rewatch this one scene. Dear listeners, the way that she's, she's just like, bye. Like it, couldn't you say like, couldn't you, couldn't you yes and him? He's pretending that these books are journeys for you. Couldn't you say, thank you very much. I will enjoy my travel. You know what I mean? Not that. That's terrible, right? But you know what I mean? Like, she just goes, bye. Like, and the way that she says that, and yes, that's a writing problem. And yes, it's a direction problem. But she didn't put any life into that scene. The Pere Robert dude, Mr. Ray Ferrone, I'm just changing his name every time. You, just, you get it right once, I right? get it right once. Yeah. I'm hoping if I throw the dartboard enough. I'm you throw, throw the dartboard at the darts. <laughs> Why did I say dartboard? (laughs) Okay. I'm hoping that if I throw enough spaghetti at the dartboard, I'll get his name right once. The point is that he is carrying that scene with all of this wonderful charisma and he's trying to riff with her and she is not giving anything back in that. She's not even smiling particularly genuinely. I couldn't tell if she liked this dude. He's loaning her books. He's the only one who doesn't judge her. He's sexy as (laughs) Or wait, he's sexy as all get out, but I don't think pairs are allowed to be sexy, right? Are those the ones who can't? I have no idea how it works. Wait, priests aren't. Catholic priests aren't we, supposed to right. do could, the thing. Yeah, okay. but anyway, be some sort of deacon or something. Sure. I don't know. He's hot is the point. Anyway, he's, he's great, and she's just not giving anything back to him. And so this is the scene I point to when I want to explain to people why I had a problem with her in this part. The other scene I point to is during Be Our Guest when she's trying to look enchanted and amused and engaged with the CGI furniture and the smile is forced and she just looks mostly, it doesn't look like she believes she's into it, which might've been a problem with interacting with so much CG, but yeah. Yeah. Interacting with so much CG could be a big part of it, but it's just, it's supposed to be amazing. Like it's and shocking and, and awe inspiring. And this is a crazy dance number with lots of, lots of colors and sparkles. And to just be like, okay, all right, next thing then, I guess. Yeah, it, it felt like the director said, smile big, Emma. And she went, okay, and just stretched her face out. And <laughs> I mean, she's just, I think she's just a shy person. And it comes through. And I mean, I think they wanted Belle to be a humble person, which makes sense. But it didn't come across as humility to me. And again, that might be a writing problem. It might be a directing problem. There's a lot of stuff going on there. I'm not saying Emma Watson is a bad person. It's just, I don't think she was right for this part. I think she was a popularity cast. 
and we have to stop now. So do you have anything last minute to say? I think she could play a very good shy character in a different movie. I loved her in Perks of Being a Wallflower. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good. It was great. And so, uh, yes, I just think it was a, a, they 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 got dollar signs in their eyes. And she was Hermione Granger, who was a bookworm. So right. they were like, Belle is a bookworm. Hermione's a bookworm. People love Emma Watson. Sold. Yeah. I mean, it was it was. It wasn't completely thought through. Right. They 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 got an answer they wanted for a reason they wanted. Would this movie have been great if they had recast Emma Watson as a charismatic, bubbly young woman who could sing? No, nah, it still would have had a lot of problems, as as you will find yes. out in subsequent episodes. As I already said, I'm not even going to pretend that we're going to get through this in, in one more episode. We're definitely going to be doing this next week and the week after. So buckle up, folks. we got a lot to say about this movie. Until then, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for existing. Thank you for helping us to maintain our marbles for just one more week. You can find all of our sort support sites in the description below. We will eventually have bonus content for our patrons it's we do have one episode already of bex to the sequel i will provide more i promise i'm trying to get my life in order i would love for you to check out my twitch channel i'm streaming every saturday morning at 10 a.m central time and there's a lot of other stuff just check out the description and click on a random link we have new merch available the maintaining my marbles shirt slash sticker slash mug slash whatever else you want it to be and we will catch you next time and thank you to our patrons one more time. Every patron, we love you. We don't know you, but we love you. Thank you. Until next time, I'm Rebecca. And I'm Alan. Bye, friends. Bye.